Andante North Africa. This is the sequel to Andante Head Normandy, both published by Osprey Games. And I really liked Andante Head Normandy, so I was very excited about this one because it's a sequel of a game that I liked, and it is a setting that I like very much, which is North Africa in World War II. Here in particular, we are in 1940, and the game depicts different actions involving the Italians on one side and the long range desert group on the other side. It's a game for two players, it is card driven, so it's a little hard to play uh, solitaire, controlling both sides, but it's possible with some adjustments. However, it is a game that is so streamlined, so intuitive and easy to play that if you don't have your adult wargaming friends at hand, you can play with your spouse. Maybe your spouse is not a hardcore gamer, but I think your spouse would be able to play. You can even play with your kids. I played this game with my seven-year-old daughter, Louisa, and she could play it, and she loves it. And I like it too, so sorry for the spoiler here. Now, more in detail, and since we are to it, I am quarantining with two daughters. They're seven and nine, so chillax already. We gotta do what we gotta do. Now, the game is played uh, by scenarios. So different scenarios will use different terrain tiles, a solid variety there, and these are really nice, sturdy, double-sided terrain tiles so with different symbols. Most importantly, with a defense value. And then we have cardboard tokens representing the position of the soldiers on the board. You also have a defensive value for there and a letter there that may indicate the squad in certain cases that is important, in certain cases it is not. And so for example, well that's a possible situation here. The game as I said is card driven, that means, and it's also a deck building game, so you will have a deck of cards uh, representing different members of your team, say I had the warrant officer, the lieutenant, an engineer in my starting deck, and then like in every war war deck building game you will have a supply. So if I have a sniper in my deck then I also have a personal supply of snipers. So you will have your deck and during the game you'll be able to buy cards and like in most uh, deck building games those cards will go in your discard pile and then when it's time for you to shuffle your discard pile and make it into a new uh, draw deck that is when those cards will get in your pile. You also fog of war cards that don't do anything, usually start with at least one in your deck, they are annoying and the several actions will put more of those in your deck clog in your hand, reducing the effectiveness on your deck, of your deck, but then there are also actions that, you may, that we allow you to remove them. Each player so has their own personal deck and their own supply of cards that can be added to the deck. At the beginning of a turn both players will draw four cards and then they will uh, select one, they will put it face down and they will, re and they will reveal it. That is what you do to determine initiative, who goes first in the turn. To do so, you look at the number in the top left corner and ignore everything else. That card is used only for initiative. I have a 9, it's the highest number, chances are that I'm going to win initiative. And so, uh, that determines who goes first, the card is discarded. So basically, each turn you will have one card used for initiative and then three cards used to activate your units. And when a card it relates to a unit on the board, then the action indicated here will be performed by that one. But you also have leaders that don't have a unit on the board and they simply have actions that benefit the entire group. And then it's pretty simple because basically you will play a card and you will do one of the actions, you will perform one of the actions indicated here. For example, the um, let me put some locations on the board, maybe scouted, as indicated by those tokens there. If a card has the move action, then you use the move action simply to move into an area that has been scouted. If a card has the scout action, then you can move into areas that have not been scouted, and you place the scout marker there. However, you also get a fog of war of card in your in your discard pile. 
just because they get your switching your lines, a lot of information, overload, 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 you get confused. However, then you also have an action that allows you, <coughs> it's called the recon action, allows you to remove a fog of war. You have the conceal action that allows you to put a fog of war card in the other player's deck. Um, attack, well that's what everybody wants to know. When you perform an attack, you determine the target. And then first thing you determine the, um, the, the defense value, the number to hit. Which is, suppose the sniper is attacking the gunner, you start by looking at the defense number of the target, you add a possible defense value for the terrain, in this case it would be zero. And then you had one for each tile of distance from the firer, from the attacker to the target. In this case it's one tile away, so it would be five. And then you draw, you roll a number of dice, dice are ten sided, equal to the number indicated here, the sniper is pretty deadly, rolls three dice, and inflict a hit if at least one of those dice is equal to or higher than the number to hit, the total modified defense value. Doesn't matter how many of those dice match or exceed the number to hit, it's still one hit. When you inflict a wound on a target, you simply remove a card for that target from the deck of the owning player. That means that 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 character will activate less often because there is one fewer card in their deck. If you eliminate all cards in the hand of the opponent and the discard pile and the deck for a certain character, the character is removed from the game. So that's how you kill people, which is not that easy. Much easier it is to suppress them, which is something that some characters can do. The gunner, for example, the gunner can suppress people, then it receives a lot of dice, it's resolved as an attack with the same modifiers and everything, but the result is that when you hit, instead of removing any card from the deck of the opponent, you flip the character to that side to indicate it's suppressed. The next time that the owning player spends a card to activate the character, all that the character does is to become unsuppressed. These are concepts that you already had in the original game, the biggest difference here is that now we have vehicles, vehicles, we have a medium tank for the Italians and then we have a bunch of other vehicles. How does it work? Suppose that we have a medium tank in this scenario, the Italians have a tank. You also have plot twist people that are specialized in driving these vehicles or doing things with them because vehicles have certain slots, so that will indicate the characters that are in the vehicle. And different positions of vehicle will allow you to do different things. However, you also need to have a specialty. So you got a driver to drive the truck. And you need the gunner to shoot guns with there, and you need a crew to do suppress or repair. You will then have a token that goes on the board that indicates the position of the vehicle. So when somebody attacks uh, the tank, they cannot attack the characters in the tank directly, but they attack the vehicle instead. And for that, <clears throat> you need anti-tank weapons. Uh, there, are, there's, a, there's somebody who has the anti-tank, and so they have the anti tank. Other thing that you can do is to do demolition that is used to demolish things on the board uh, to achieve certain objectives. But basically when somebody with the capability to attack an armored vehicle attacks them then again they are firing against the uh, defense of the of the vehicle plus is usually terrain and distance. If they score a hit everybody in the vehicle takes an uh, damage and also the vehicle takes a damage and you place a token to indicate that. The vehicle has two values, so when the lowest value is met, then the vehicle is disabled, so it cannot do it. You cannot do anything with it, but it can still it's not destroyed yet, so it can still be repaired by using the the repair action, which uh, it's someone if the vehicle reaches the higher number of damage tokens, then the vehicle is destroyed and everybody that is in it bails out. 
You can spend actions to switch people, move people around the vehicle as opposed to exiting and entering the vehicle is a free action as part of an activation of a character. So this is the biggest, this is the biggest uh, difference that we have here. So in general, it's very similar to Undaunted uh, Normandy, but with new scenarios, new art, and most importantly, a whole new mechanic representing vehicles. Undaunted Normandy was a game that I enjoyed very much, and I enjoyed Undaunted North Africa even more. Because I like the North African scenario, uh, theater operation in the historical counterpart of this game, but also because, well, it's a really fun game. For some of you, maybe there isn't enough of a war game here. I've seen comments online, but this is just Dominion with a thin thematic layer with some uh, pasted on theme. If that's how you see it, that's, that's your prerogative, but that's not how I see it. To me, this is a game that has substance. Sure, it simulates its topic in a light way, um, but there are some dynamics there, like the suppression, uh, the, the role of leadership, uh, the role of scouting. There's just so much information in other games, and even tactical games, in which you're just, just running into areas that you have never seen. Here, well, send the flipping scout first, or use a plane to use a recon action. Uh, again, the fog of war, the tempo of military operations, to me, is captured very well by the uh, deck building mechanism and by other mechanics such as the scouting, etc, etc, etc. One thing, of course, uh, that seems to be more like video game than anything else is that people can be shot a couple of times, get a lot of injuries before they die entirely, before they're completely disabled. Um, but, frankly, that to me doesn't, doesn't bother me, again, because that doesn't have to be a perfect simulation. And you can also think that what is injury doesn't represent a physical wound. It represents the, the soldier, again, losing the situational awareness or effectiveness, and that's why, or panicking, and that's why the soldier activates less often, not just because it was hit a couple of times and still kind of activates fairly well. But again, you have so many options, so many different things that you can do uh, because each card comes with, uh, with, with several options, several things that you can do. And it's really fun to chain, chain and combine actions in different ways. Here is the, here's the scout moving there, uh, getting out of focal war in the process, then I activate the scout again to at least remove one of those. Then, that I have in my hand, maybe from a previous round, then I'm moving somebody in, or I'm using a commander to get extra activations, and then the gunner gets there and suppresses somebody else, etc, etc, etc. It just has so many interesting little layers. These are things that I liked in the original game, and I like in this one also, because it's, it's very similar to that one, and to me that's fine. More of the same is good, if the original thing was good. And the biggest new thing that we have here, which is vehicles, they work very well. If anything else, I like I would have liked more of them. I hope there are expansions in which we have more tanks, and so we get more of a tank battle. You only have one tank, you have other vehicles, and it's still fun. I mean, this always was about individual human beings more than machines. It always was about the white of their eyes, about the suppression, about these individual struggles. So it's fine. Uh, we had that nice little addition here, which I think actually works very well. Great variety of scenarios, uh, great production values, uh, crystal clear rulebook, but most importantly, a really solid game. And one that is so simple, so intuitive, uh, that you can play with a seven-year-old. At least I've done that. My seven-year-old daughter, Louisa, loves this game. I sure he asked me to play it again. Tomorrow we're gonna have a game day. It's going to be Undaunted, it's going to be other games that they asked me to play, so it's going to be a great game, it's going to be a great day of, of gaming, 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 and more gaming, and I think we're going to go through like every scenario in the rulebook, all those, mo all, most of them, because my daughter is in love with this game, and I'm so happy because I love it too, and I can't wait to play it again. 
and don't turn North Africa. It's simple, it's modern, it's hip almost, thanks to the reliance on a, a new 21st century mechanic, the deck building element. But to me that uh, is meshed very well with wargaming elements and with a very strong wargaming feel. To me this is not Dominion with soldiers on the cards. It is a war game. It is a war game. It is a war game. It is a war game that just happens to use a mechanic that originated outside a war game, but works very well in this context. Undaunted North Africa. I love it.